Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at a dual band mobile called the AR2520. This is a low cost radio from China made by Abri. It's one of the smallest high power mobile radios that I've ever seen. Measuring a really tiny 4 inches wide and a depth of approximately 5 inches including the volume control and the SO239 socket on the rear. On the back of the unit there isn't much in the way of connectivity, just a fixed power cable and fuse unit and 2 pin quick disconnect socket. The only other port is a 3.5mm jack socket that doesn't appear to be for an external speaker. There is a small fan at the rear of the unit to keep things cool when using high power. The entire body of the Abri is made from heavy duty metal and in common with similar radios like the Anytone AT778 it forms a heat sink to keep the unit temperature down. The radio is quoted as being 25 watts on high power across all frequencies but we'll test that soon so more about that a little bit later on. The radio can transmit all the way from 136 right up to 520 MHz continuous in the FM mode but also has the added bonus of airband reception from 108 to 136 MHz in the AM mode. The radio comes from many Chinese suppliers including AliExpress around the $65 mark for the basic model and for an extra $10 you can get the GPS enabled version of the radio but more about that soon. The review model we have here today is the GPS version. One thing to be aware of is that the radio doesn't always come supplied with the USB programming cable. Our review model was shipped without one in the box and I had to pay an additional $10 to get one shipped over. Not a big deal but having to wait another week was a bit of a pain when I wanted to get started on the review and it's also used for updating the firmware. So looking at the front panel of the radio we've got a nice high resolution colour screen and this does seem quite impressive for the low cost. It's easy to read and nice and bright during the daytime. There is plenty to look at on the screen, it's a bit busy but well laid out and we can see two lines for VFOA and VFOB. So where the radio is capable of dual band receive as can many other Chinese radios that allow the monitoring of two frequencies at once. There is only one receiver in the radio but it switches between the two VFO registers when a signal is detected. You can turn this feature on and off and go back to single receive if that bothers you. What's impressive about the display on the radio is that you can have long names for any memory channels you've stored. Some much more expensive radios only allow 8 characters for the name of a channel but here you can be a little bit more descriptive and the active VFO always shows the frequency and the channel name at the bottom of the screen. This is great for those who like to see the full information. Speaking of memories, there are a thousand channels to store from your favourites but sadly there is no form of memory bank management which is common with the Chinese radios. It kind of makes having so much storage useless as you can't manage the channels effectively, for example grouping 2 meters, 70 sems, marine and airband. It's about time that this feature was introduced since it will be easy to do in firmware but the majority of Chinese manufacturers seem unwilling to invest the time into doing this. On the front of the unit there is a modular jack plug for connecting the illuminated keypad microphone. This is a direct frequency entry microphone with up and down keys and can be used to start scanning along with access to the menu. The microphone is very lightweight and feels a bit cheap in the hand. With it being so lightweight it tends to slip off the desk or whatever surface you place it down onto. It could do with a little bit of weight adding inside it to stop this happening and it doesn't give the best impression of the build quality. On the left hand side you've got the standard PTT button but looking carefully shows a second PTT underneath this button. This can be used to transmit on the second VFO without switching bands. This may or may not be to your liking as it's easy to hit the wrong button and transmit on the wrong frequency. You'll either love it or hate it. We don't do full unboxing videos here but you do get a metal bracket along with some mounting screws, a brief instruction book written in reasonable English and obviously the power cables, the radio and the microphone but that's really all you need to get started. Turning on the radio is a matter of holding down the rotary control knob on the front of the unit for a couple of seconds. One thing I did like about the unit is a proper volume control and that's all the control knob does. It turns on the radio and controls the volume level. There is no rotary VFO control. That's all done from the up and down buttons on the front of the keypad. There are a number of square buttons with symbols on the front of the unit. The red button switches the active VFO between the memory and direct frequency entry. The two white buttons either side of the up and down key let you access the menu. The first takes you into the menu and the second acts like an exit key. Navigating the menu is fairly straightforward. You simply go into the settings menu and you scroll up and down using the arrow keys. There are 59 options available in the current firmware and on the menu many different options can be adjusted including step, roger beep, dual display, squelch, CTCSS, DCS, repeater shifts plus many other things too. 
Now this is where it gets interesting because I noticed a couple of options on the menu including TX and RX recording and Bluetooth. Neither of these things were mentioned when I purchased the radio so I did wonder if they'd work. I tried selecting the recording option but they failed and came up with an error message. This was to be expected as it appears to be another option that I've not seen advertised and maybe for a future production model. Likewise the Bluetooth function failed so this must also be for a model fitted with different options. You'd think they'd be hidden but the firmware just feels a little bit rough around the edges. The model I have here has got the GPS function enabled. I went into the options and turned on the GPS to see what would happen. After a few minutes I managed to get a lock onto the GPS satellite signal and basic coordinates were displayed. Now I understand that the unit can transmit positioning information to other similar radios nearby and show a distance and bearing between the two units. But don't get too excited, this isn't an APRS setup like Kenwood, Icom or Yesu. It appears to be just a basic GPS coordinate system, although another YouTuber did manage to get the unit to output its raw GPS coordinate data through a terminal session, which could be seen and used with some third party software. That requires the GPS monitor to be turned on in the menu, so there is some hope that in a future production this could be developed further. One option in the menu allows for a Roger Beep to be enabled, but the other option is a data burst that will send GPS coordinates to another unit every time you release the PTT. Interesting stuff at this low price. Another bonus feature built into the radio is the FM broadcast band. If there is nothing to listen to on the band, you can always tune into your favourite FM radio station, and as soon as activity occurs on the channel you're monitoring, the radio will automatically switch back. The receiver does seem quite sensitive, as I was picking up the FM broadcast band's radio stations with the antenna disconnected. So what is the radio actually like on reception, I hear you ask? Well, the sound from the built-in speaker was surprisingly good considering the low cost. The audio is loud, well balanced and not distorted even at high volume and would be fine mounted in a car but that's probably as well considering that there doesn't appear to be an external speaker option since the jack at the rear is a bit strange. During our testing we did plug in a unit and Bearcat external speaker and managed to get some sound from the unit but not consistently. We did hear some crackling and the external speaker didn't cut off. I'm not sure if that's a problem with our review unit or maybe they're all the same. Ok, let's check the power level on the radio across the VHF and UHF frequencies. It's kind of expected that the power will vary slightly, but we've got the trusty Shawcom SW102 meter to test that into a dummy load. So first, the high power settings are around 145MHz. As you can see, the radio is delivering a healthy 18 watts, but not quite the 25 watts promised on the box. And on low power around 14 watts so there isn't much difference between the two power levels there now let's try that again on 440 megahertz we're seeing around 20 watts into the dummy load on high power and around 4 watts on low power. This is much more balanced in the 70cm UHF frequency than on the VHF, so it looks like another thing that could be fixed in firmware maybe. As we're keying up on the radio and it begins to heat up, we can see the small fan in the back of the unit starts to kick in, and this appears to be temperature controlled. We can also see that a small fan symbol on the screen indicates the operation of the fan unit. Interestingly enough, early models of this radio were released with a firmware bug that meant that the fan didn't run at all in the unit. This was on firmware version 1.06, but recently a new 1.08 firmware was released fixing the non-functioning fan problem. After flashing this unit with the firmware, it corrected the issue, but that's where we come on to another problem, more bugs in the firmware. The most obvious one I found was during the use of the scan function. If you start the unit scanning using the microphone key with the hash symbol, the radio will start to scan. However, if you want to stop the unit scanning, be careful about which key you press. If you hit the PTT button, the unit will lock up, the fan will start running, and a random frequency appears on the display. The only way to recover from this problem is to pop the power lead out. 
and then reboot the radio. To me, this is a terrible bug that should never have seen the radio released until it was fixed. It was present in both 1.06 and 1.08, and of January 2024, the problem still exists. We can only hope that this is eventually fixed and the manufacturer listens to the end users. Apart from the problems mentioned, the radio shows a lot of potential. The menu system is comprehensive, easy to navigate using the keys on the front panel. Memories are programmable directly from the radio, so no PC programming is required out in the field. Scrolling through the options is easy with the up and down keys, and if you have a good memory, you can jump to a specific menu option by keying the number of the option into the microphone keypad. For example, number 27 is TX power options. Abri have provided some PC programming software for the AR2520. It's basic, but it seems to work pretty well, and I encountered no issues with reading and writing the memories and options using a Windows 11 PC. The driver that the PC programming cable uses is called the CH340 and appears to be automatically downloaded from the Windows update the first time you connect the cable. Once you've identified the correct port number for your computer, everything just seems to work. Sadly, in common with most Chinese CPS software, there is only basic memory management available and you can't easily move a memory location up or down to reorganise channels once you've programmed them in. This is always a little awkward when there is a thousand memory slots available. Let's hope in the future that Chirp can start to support this radio and someone can make the interface available. Apart from this, the software lets you set the full range of options available for the Abri AR2520, including the scanning options, GPS settings, frequency steps and other interesting things such as the programmable keys labelled P1 to P3 on the front panel. I really wanted to set one of the front keys to control the high and low power function, but sadly that's not an option, and something that I hope is added as a future update. You'd think this would be quite an obvious use of the P keys, but no luck at the moment. One cool feature inside the CPS is the ability to set your own startup picture or logo. Simply grab your favourite picture, scale it accordingly using the utility built into the software, and next time the radio is booted, you'll see a custom image, and that's a neat trick. If you're programming a fleet of company vehicles, you can add your company logo to all the radios easily. Moving on to the on-air test, we tried the radio on the 2 meter amateur radio band, but I also programmed up a range of marine, airband and PMR frequencies to see how well the radio receives across the range. Whilst I found the reception quality generally very good with rich tone quality coming from the built-in speaker, I need to warn about the AM airband reception. Again, this is another radio that claims to receive AM airband, but unfortunately delivers in the same way that many other Chinese radios do. It can be quite bad at times. The best way to describe this is similar to the Quansheng UVK5. Sometimes reception is passable, and other times it's distorted. Let's take a listen. So as you can see, there is work to do in this area, and it'd be nice to see if this is resolved in a future firmware update, or maybe even open source the firmware in the same way that has happened with the Quansheng. I wonder if it's even possible, or if the radio uses a similar chip to the Quansheng series of radios. Clearly, if that's the case, then the future could be very interesting. Anyway, time to take the radio on air and show you how well it really works. M0DPH, show you by the frequency. This is Golf 7, Uniform Foxtrot Sierra calling. Yeah, got you, Paul. Well, this is the Abri uh, connected up onto the big um, X300 antenna. And uh, for the benefit of everybody else out there who's uh, wondering, we're probably about, um, what would you say, in a straight line? Are we four or five miles apart or maybe a little bit further, Paul? Back to you. Yeah, I would have said probably between four and five miles apart. Sorry about the interference there to the side of the radio. Yeah, I would have said between four and five, possibly. 
possibly even six. Yeah, okay, Paul. Yeah, well, that's good then. Um, so anyway, sounding good. The audio is booming through here. You got a little bit of background noise on your audio, but that's coming from the uh, wiring in your car, I think. We've uh, had this discussion before, haven't we, about the audio artifacts on your transmission. But um, yeah, it's all um, sounding pretty good, that is, Paul. Um, I must admit, the, the built-in speaker on this Adbury is uh, pretty impressive there, about you. Yeah, Roger. Yeah, your audio is absolutely crystal clear. Can't fault it. Your signal is a good 5.9 plus, 5.9 plus, more than. Um, I can't fault your audio in any way, shape or form. I always find it very hard to distinguish between the audio on that and your FTM 400. Um, yeah, I never know whether you've switched over, so it's, uh, it, it's certainly good clear crisp audio. I can't fault it anyway. <laughs> Okay, G7 UFS returning. Yeah, okay, Paul. Um, no problem at all. Yeah, it's, it's really good audio uh, both ways on this one. I'm going to record it into an SDR later on to get a bit of a better idea as well of uh, how it sounds myself. So I'm going to record myself into the um, SDR play and uh, maybe get a bit of audio that way as well. But um, yeah, it's all working as it should do. Um, the reception quality is good. There's a signal meter at the bottom of the uh, radio on this uh, signal byte. Also shows modulation as I'm talking to you there. So it goes from red, uh, yellow and green. And your signal was just into the green area. It comes up at about 54, I think it is, into the green. But it does take a lot to make it go all the way across. It is kind of uh, a relative signal strength meter. And it, it, like I say, when it's a low signal, it goes red, then it goes amber, and then it goes uh, green as it goes up to the full. So you're just knocking it into the uh, green on this uh, Abri AR2520. Uh, but yeah, it's, um, it's quite a nice little radio, really. I mean, for the price, I mean, what we paid for it, just under uh, £50 in the UK. It was about $65, $68, I think. This is the model with the GPS inside it as well, so it can send GPS bursts between different transceivers, but... Um, I've not fully worked that one out yet as to uh, what format it's sending. Uh, I've seen another couple of videos on YouTube that do something similar. Uh, and you can get the GPS data out of the radio through the microphone port when you turn GPS monitor on. Um, and you can maybe do some kind of plots onto a mapping system or something like that to show your location. But um, yeah, it's uh, pretty good there. So uh, back to you there, Paul. M0DPH, the G7UFS. Yeah, no problem, Paul. Yeah, if you want to give it a try, that's all, all being well. It should work okay. I reckon uh, we've got a good chance of making it across there. So you've got a little um, handheld with you. So yeah, just uh, fire away then, Paul. I'll just take a standby for a minute and uh, see if I can hear you. Back to you. Okay, no problem. Give me two minutes and I'll jump out the car with, uh, with the handheld and we'll, we'll give it a whirl and see what check the audio quality through the handheld. More for your benefit on your, uh, on your video there so you can see the audio quality coming from your speaker. So. Give me two minutes and I'll, uh, I'll get you out. M0DPH, taking a quick standby. Yeah, okay there, Paul. I'll just stand by for a minute. GSMUFS uh, standing by on frequency. Yeah, M0DPH, G7UFS returning. Yeah, no problem at all, Paul. It's um, sounding very good. Um, yeah, obviously the modulation is not as loud as the uh, TMV71, but uh, it's crystal clear. Everything's fine. You, you were giving me about, uh, I think, 40-something on the display, whatever that is. It's 40, 42 out of 100. Uh, it's a kind of weird relative kind of display, but... Um, yeah, it's uh, sounding crystal clear. No bother at all with that. And uh, that's um, your little handheld. I don't know how many watts it's putting out there, but um, it won't be as much as the other radio, that's for sure. But um, yeah, cracking through okay. And uh, I'm just looking at the front panel display on this Abri, and um, as we're talking, the fans kicked in on this radio, and uh, the little fan symbol is spinning round in the bottom left corner of the screen. So before the firmware update, uh, the fan symbol used to spin round, but uh, nothing used to actually happen. 
it didn't actually engage the fan or anything, but since the last firmware update, which is version 1.08, it's uh, cured the issue with the fan not running. And now I've got a little bit of fan noise, uh, just coming out the back of the radio, keeping it cool. I'll put my hand on top of the rig, it's not getting really warm, and it is on high power as well, so that's about 20 watts going out there. But it's, um, it's working absolutely fine. I, I'm really, really pleased with how good this radio is for the money. Like I say, there is some firmware issues with... Um, you know, one or two issues on the actual menu system and uh, the scanning and everything. But apart from that, it's it's all good there. Back to you, uh, Paul. Zero DPH returning. Yeah, it is a 5 watt hand build. It's 5 watts into an uh, into aftermarket antenna. But uh, your audio quality from this side coming through the handheld speaker is, uh, is still pristine. I can't fault it whatsoever. It's, uh, uh, there's no background noise from your fan or anything like that. So it's... Uh, Doing very, very well. Like I said, the handheld I'm using is a GT3. It's uh, very old, very old. I got it when it first came out, so it's still doing well. And, and like I said, I can't fault that radio in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, excellent, Paul. Excellent. Yeah, I don't know if I actually told you, um, these Abris do receive airband as well, but the airband reception quality isn't as good, really. It suffers from a similar fate as the Quan Sheng. Uh, where it sounds distorted on the AM mode, um, you can't switch between AM and FM automatically on these. It's um, automatically engaged when you go down to an airband frequency, um, and it does sound kind of semi-distorted. I'm going to try and record a bit of audio in a minute just to see if I can uh, illustrate what I mean. But it's very similar to the Quan Sheng with the custom, you know, with the stock firmware. But obviously the Quan Shengs have had some custom firmware written for them, so it made me think. I wonder what the chipset is inside this radio. I've got no idea, but obviously there's no documentation really for these things without taking one apart and having a look at it yourself. But um, I wonder if it's possible to get the, um, you know, some custom firmware made for one of these radios to, uh, you know, cure the AM problem or maybe add some more functionality to it. But um, certainly a very impressive piece of kit for the money there. Uh, back to you, Paul, M0DPH, g 7 Yeah, I'm impressed with the size of the radios as well. Uh, obviously with the newer cars, you don't get a lot of space in Size of that thing, it, it will fit in most vehicles. I would have thought, I'm sure you could be able to find a pocket or a space somewhere where you can squeeze it. So, uh, it's uh, it certainly fits the uh, the newer, newer style car interiors. Hello, well, Mark. Uh, the name here is David, um, situated 80 miles northeast of Newcastle upon Tyne. The issue I've got with this Raspberry Pi, I've tried two different memory cards, micro cards. Uh, formatted them using the proper, the as, as instructed on the internet. I've used Bellina Etcher. I've actually got the image onto the card. I can take the card out and read it, and the image is there. I'm uh, putting the Wi-Fi supplement file in. Um, once it's written, I take the card out and check it again, and I can see that it's there. And when I put it into the Pi, it just sits there. Yesterday, I believe... So I got an IP address of of um, of mentioned Pi. Um, I got the red dashboard up saying what am I, and I started to fill the details in, and then it went off. The, and and the IP address just totally vanished from the IP scanner that I had. So I've redone it this afternoon there, um, and and just basically drag and dropped and this that and the other, and I'm still having no success. But it seems to be, if I hardwire it, sometimes I get the um, the IP address, sometimes I don't. Very 
Case 8, uh, traffic information, the outbound vessel transporter will uh, require a good swing to the south, so it may remain uh, as close to mid-channel as possible. Yeah, see, on the starboard side, I'm going to say wind speed still uh, 21, uh, just gone down to 19.7. Uniform Foxtrot Sierra testing the Abri AR2520. Testing, testing, 123, audio 123. This is the Abri using 145 decimal 400 on SDR Connect so we can listen to the audio quality. 54321 12345 Abri AR2520. This is what the audio sounds like from the standard hand microphone. Just talking about two inches away from the microphone. 54321 one, two, three, four, five. So conclusions. As you can see, the Abri AR2520 is a very capable little radio that is fine to use whilst out mobile. The audio quality is surprisingly good and reports on both transmit and receiver being favourable. The unit does get quite warm whilst working on high power, but the fan does seem to make a difference. Apart from the AM airband reception issues, I found the radio quite sensitive as I could hear the aircraft and ground control on some frequencies over a distance of 50 miles. This is equally as good as some of my much more expensive Yaesu gear. However, the negative aspects of the radio are the slightly unfinished firmware that seems like it's still work in progress. It's almost like Abri wants the end customer to become the beta tester for their products. All we can hope is that some future firmware glitches, including the total lockup or crashing of the unit, is resolved in the near future with another firmware update. Certainly this little radio has the potential to become a best seller if they can resolve these issues. At the price of around $60, it's an absolute bargain and I'd love to see the enhanced version with the Bluetooth and audio recording options enabled. Let us know what you think of the radio in the comments below. Would you go and buy one of these radios in the hope that future updates will be forthcoming? Do you think it's good value for money? I'll leave it there until next time, but until then, send me freeze to all, don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll catch you in the next video. Over and out.